Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Indeed, this is my last City Talk until at least September 2016. Say it isn't so. It, it, it's so. I'm on sabbatical, writing a book, conducting archival movie research on silent movies, taking a break. But City Talk will be in the hands of a real media pro, Tony Guida. Hello, Doug. Nice to be here. Tony has been a fixture in New York City television. Indeed, he's been ubiquitous for decades. I remember watching him when we both had lots of color in our hair. <laughs> Starting in 1970 at WOR-TV, first as a reporter and then as an anchor. Then you were at NBC as the chief political reporter. Then you were at CBS. Then you were back to NBC as chief of political reporter, then you went back to CBS as an anchor, then on to CNN, and then to CBS National. So you've been all over. Couldn't keep a job. We'll talk about <laughs> not keeping job in a moment. Let's start with not keeping a job. You have... Oh, you want to start? Yes, yeah, I want to okay. start all with right. mass firings. Oh. You have been the victim of not one, but two mass media firings. Let's start with the first one because this is the one I real. This is the one I remember. It was a shock. Well, I it don't. It was mind yeah, blowing. Well, it, I don't. First of all, I don't consider myself a victim because I think I consider these are An badges object. of honor. Oh, okay. The, the, for me, because you know, in my business, our business, we're like. Uh, uh, baseball managers were hired to be fired. But anyway, you're right. This thing that happened at Channel 2 on October 2nd, 1996. Yep. How does he remember that? Uh, unprecedented. Now, that's a word that gets tossed no, around. No, but this but is unprecedented. It had never happened like this before. It has never happened since. It was a massacre. And it happened in like that. It was a St. Valentine. They lined us up against the wall and they shot us. This uh, is metaphorically, metaphorically, but yes. of course. I, I think. Well, I don't yeah. know. The whole uh, it, what happened was they fired Channel 2's management fired half the staff, the on-air staff, in one shot. There were four anchor people. They fired three of us. There was a sports guy. They fired him. There was a weather guy. They fired him. They fired two reporters and I think somebody else. Seven people gone in 30 seconds. And the way they did it was, as you came off the air that day, somebody met you at the edge of the set and said, come up to the boss's office. And the boss said, you're done. Don't come in tomorrow. Here's your money. <laughs> and you say, what? And the story was so... Uh, uh, huge that it made the front page of both tabloids. Right. The Daily News and the Post. Okay. Daily News anchors away. Pretty cute. Right. Yeah, and the very other cute. one, Bloodbath at Channel 2. Seven top anchors, reporters, get the axe. Well, the interesting thing, and I don't know if you have a close-up, uh, the interesting thing about the Post headline, front page, is that look at that front page. The, 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 the story we're sharing the front page with is that Netanyahu and Arafat have been have apparently successfully concluded some, yep. some uh, uh, secret negotiations, uh, you know, summit negotiation or something. And we get precedence over that? Well, that, that I mean, come, that this absurd, about no sense. This absurd story gets precedence well, over that? Well, I mean, it's a bit, it's a New York story. Yeah. And, but you're pointing out something about the news media. And, the, and, and here, in this, they actually put our pictures. And it says, out, out, out. And look at that hair. Look I, at that hair. I, well, I mean, come on. How did they let me on the air? I, I, like, I, I don't know. The, tr the truth of the matter is, 
Channel 2 at that time, 96, was bad. It, we were third in the ratings, which meant we were last, uh, because basically compared to the other two network, you know, ch Channel 2 was CBS, 4, NBC, 7, ABC. Compared to 4 and 7, we were last. Right. And we'd been last. And change, something needed to change, but you don't do this. And especially when you don't have a plan. This happened, you don't throw seven, half your staff out, and, and you have them. nobody. Right. There was October 2nd that this happens. It was March before anybody showed up to replace any of us. They, they put the screws on the, you know, on, the, on the bench players, the rest of the staff, to fill in for us for five months. Crazy. I I had spoken to John Johnson afterwards, one of the anchors that were fired, and it would, and he tells the story that he was doing the six and the eleven and right. said, "We'll see you at 11. <laughs> Wrong. Right. You, we're not seeing you at eleven. It's, you're gone. Somebody said, "Right, it's six thirty. You're not. You're not okay. coming back at all. Okay. We're going to run. You know, uh, uh, Laurel and Hardy and uh, who knows. Or, or, or but the little thing, rascals. Uh, but getting back to my comment about why I consider this. Um, uh, sort of a badge of honor, I don't know. But what it did is give me the two most cherished mementos of my career, the, these front pages, which I've got at home. You know, there they are. In I mean, 30 years when we do the epitaph, you want these two men. Oh, definitely. Oh, okay, let's go to CNN and then generalize, and then let's talk about some of the stories that you've been telling me. It's the year 2000. Uh, Time Warner, which owns CNN, sure. merges with AOL. Right. It's, this is the merger that is going to cure cancer and bring peace to the Middle East. I mean, this is it. You this know, is if you go back and look at the headlines... The world's going to change. The world will change. Cancer is solved. Peace in our land because Time Warner merges with AOL. Now, that marriage didn't last very long, but go ahead. Yes, I was going to just say, how did that work out? CNN, part of Time Warner, mergers, what happens? Well, there are layoffs. They call them layoffs. I call them firing. At CNN, 450 people were fired as a result of this merger. I was one of them. And it wasn't really a surprise because after the merger happened, there were all kinds oh, yeah. of rumors. And there came this Monday when it started to happen. And again, like at Channel 2, but now, of course, this is 24-hour. Sure. So as people came off the set, they were met by somebody who said, you go up to the office upstairs, and then the office upstairs, boom, boom, end. I did a show from 2 to 4 with another guy named Bill Tucker, who was one of the original no, I know. CNN guys. Yep, yep. They were 1980 when it started. We come off the, 2 to 4, we come off the set, and there's the woman, and she says to Bill... And I think, oh, geez, Bill is... And I figured I'm going to get it, too. So about half an hour later, she comes looking for me. I go upstairs, and I'm ushered into an office uh, where there's a man sitting behind a table, and I've never seen him before. I have no idea who he is. And now he's been doing this all day, so it's like boilerplate. I'm sorry, your job has been eliminated. And this lady is from HR, and if you have any questions, you talk to her. Are, you, are there any questions? And I, you know, and I was resigned to this, and I did. Right. I, you know, it's like this is baloney. Just get it. Right. So I said, no, Just no questions, me. and I leave. And I walk downstairs, and I, I, I say to Bill Tucker, he said that you. I said, yeah. I said, who is that guy? And he says, you don't know? I said, no, I don't. I never saw him before. He was the, pre Bill tells me, he was the president of, president of CNN Espanol. They had sent him up from Atlanta to, to Just lower to the, the boom, job, uh, yeah. blew the hatchet job. Yep. Whatever. And here's the, here's the thing about that. I, about one o'clock in the morning, I wake up in bed like with a boom. And I say to him, you stupid son of a, when the guy said, do you have any questions, why didn't I say, yeah, I got a question. What's your name? <laughs> and where do you live? No, just, I know where what's your, your children. name? Oh, I was doing an Italian route. Now, what's your name? Like, you just fired me. You don't even introduce yourself. What's your name? 
But I thought, yeah, dummy, you missed a big opportunity. Okay, let's move on to some reporting. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of Gaida over the years. I mean, literally from 1970 on. And, I, and I, I'm an instructor at the graduate school yeah, well, of journalism uh, at uh, CUNY. One of your pieces is for CBS is the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And it really is sort of a model and a microcosm of a reporter's life. So we're going to play the whole two minute and 30 oh, second okay. segment. And then we're going to sort of break it down before we get into what the hell you're going to do once you get and sit on this side of the table. Talk about the piece. For the 8 million residents of America's largest city, the 9-11 attacks were personal. And for them, today's commemoration was personal as well, as they observed the milestone, each in his or her own way. Tony Gaida has been out taking the pulse of the city. In three words, said Robert Frost, I can sum up everything I've learned about life. It goes on. Kimberly and Noah posed for wedding pictures on a cobblestone street 10 blocks from Ground Zero. What they've learned about life is that they want to live it together. Optimism. Optimism. Writer Pete Hamill lives near Ground Zero and watched the towers fall. New Yorkers, he says, know how to move on. The kind of healthy fatalism is what I would call it. Whatever it's called, it was manifest at a midtown firehouse where children played while their parents remembered. Remembered the 12 firefighters from this company who died 10 years ago. Remembered to live, no matter how difficult. We know when we need to grieve, and we also know when we need to celebrate. Janine Esposito, very pregnant, is eager to celebrate. When is the baby due? No, the baby was due three days ago. Oh, three days ago. <laughs> yeah. Janine and her friends ate brunch at a bistro eight blocks from Ground Zero. One of them is apartment hunting in the neighborhood. He wants to move closer to Ground Zero. We have gone through a lot, and I just, I, I'd actually rather be in this area than any other area today. Mike Judge was known as the Fireman's Friar, the chaplain of the New York Fire Department. He was carried out of Tower One 10 years ago. Father Michael Judge. They remembered him and 343 colleagues at a special mass today. Our collective heart was broken on September 11. In many ways, it was a deep wound, not just physical, but psychological to a lot of other people. And I think that has largely healed. And life does go on. The memorial opens to the public tomorrow at 10 a.m. You must have a reservation for a specific time on a specific date. They plan to accommodate 1,500 visitors a day. Russ? Tony Guida, you're in Lower Manhattan. Thank you so much. I share it with you because it's one of my favorite stories uh, of all, you know, from what, 40 years. It's one of my favorite stories. How did it happen? It's 9-11. It's the 10th anniversary of 9-11. It's happening on a Sunday. I'm working for CBS Network News. The lead story, of course, will be the day's events. Sure. The anchor man will handle that. In the morning meeting with the executive producer, she says to me, you know, we want a companion story, a sidebar. Go out there and, you know, and she doesn't, you know, it's not, it's like, go find something. And it would tell Make us how you, useful. Right. And I walk out of the thing thinking, geez, this is a big day. And I've been just, I've just been handed a blank canvas to paint on. And I think, I better be a good artist, painter. And so you start to think about what we call in the, in the business elements, the, the, the building blocks of a story. What, what's going to go into this story? And you know some things, and some things are there on the schedule. So one thing I know is that the first thing I know, the bard of New York City, the man who sings the song of this city better than anyone is Pete Hamill. Love Pete. And He's I, been here. Yeah. And I call Pete. I fortunately I know him. And I, Pete, I'm doing it. Will you be on? Sure. We'll do the interview. Okay. Element number one. Element number two on the schedule at 11 in the morning is going to, or 11.30, is going to be a mass for the firefighters, all firefighters who died. Now, I'm not so much interested in the mass, and I don't mean to sound crass here, but 
it gives me the idea there's an icon iconic photo. Yes. For, well, there are many, but there's this one uh, from 9-11, which is uh, uh, Michael Judge, who was the uh, fire department chaplain. Right being carried out, mm. slumped Oof. in the arms of firefighters. He's dead. He's been killed. I in, and I, said, I, can, I want to use that photo. I go to the mass. They're going to mention the names of all 343 and Michael, and they're going to ring the fire bell. And when they, you know, so I'll have that, that part of it, and then I can use the picture. So now I got two things, and I'm thinking, that's not enough. <laughs> So I say to the cameraman, this is where the luck comes in. I say to the cameraman, let's drive down to Tribeca and just see what we find. And we're driving down Washington Street, and as we pass some intersection, I forget what it was, Cobblestone Street, here are these two people, this young man and woman in their wedding clothes, posing for pictures. And I go, wow. And he go, the cameraman, wow. And we can't get out of the truck fast enough, get the camera and start making shots. And as I'm looking at this, I say, this is the key. This is the metaphor. I don't know what metaphor it is yet, but this is going to make, this is going to elevate this piece from the, from the mundane to the, something special. Right. <laughs> and so we get them and get a couple of other things. And I'm back in the office. It's like, four o'clock, and it was six o'clock, you know, show. And I'm sitting there, and the cursor's flashing on the screen. It's like mocking me, you know, like, because it's still blank. And I'm going, I, I know I've got it. I know I've got it. And it finally hits me, the theme, life goes on. That's what they are, and that's what the firefighters say, and that's what Pete talks about. Life goes on. But what made it, you know, some of it is the art of having experience sure. and knowing right. to call Pete Hanson. Right. And but the rest of it is luck. Luck that and couple. Yep. Yep. And sometimes luck is the, the result or the residue of design, but sometimes it's just luck. Right. Most embarrassing moment, you got a minute and a half. I got a minute and a half. It happens with Charles Corralt, who was my idol. I revered this man. I so revered him because folks. of his writing. I also love that. Basso, that voice, but his writing. This guy, his writing was luminous. He, he wrote poetry on deadline. And I just, so I'm a co-anchor of Live at Five in 1980-whatever, 88, <clears throat> maybe. And he's booked as a guest. He's coming on to promote a book uh, called Life on the Road. And, of course, he did sure. all those on the sure. road. And I'm going to interview him. Now, here's an example of, 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 of Corralt's writing. The first page of that book, he talks about being born. And his family lived on a farm 50 miles from the hospital, near the, the nearest hospital. So his mother goes into labor. Mom and dad, frantic, get in the car. They drive 50 miles to Wilmington, North Carolina. He's born. And here's what, how he writes it. This sentence. I was born the next morning with rambling in my blood and 50 miles already under my belt. Perfect. I mean, he's got you at hello. I mean, he... So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview this guy. I'm going to do an introduction. I'm going to do a Corolkian uh -oh. introduction. I'm going to write... Go ahead. And so I write all day, and, you know, I'm throwing, bing, blah, blah, and I'm trying... And then, anyway, finally comes to five... 30, 545, whatever, and he's there, like you and me, and so this is what I say to introduce him. You probably think TV news is a visual medium, but it works best when good words accompany good pictures. Charles Corralt has been writing good words for CBS News for 33 years, and now has put a few thousand of them into a book, A Life on the Road. A sweet and humorous and in one way surprising memoir about how his intense wanderlust became a distinguished career. Welcome, Mr. And before I can say Carol, he says, my, my, that was a marvelous introduction. I lose it. I just, I'm stunned and I go, I blubber, oh, oh, thank you, Mr. Carol. I wrote it myself. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> as I heard those words echo in, I wanted the floor of the studio to open up and, this and is, swallow me. Well, and it should have. And that's the original paper. That this you is did? the original. Oh, paper. The, look, the, it says this could go to the Smithsonian. Look, this is the. Take, take shot, shot of Corolla. Take add image. Nice, like, nice. Yeah. Okay. This is the original. Okay, so you have this illustrious I wish I had career. it on tape. I don't have that. Yeah, tape. I, bet, I bet you it's somewhere. Maybe in Vanderbilt in there. You, you, you're you, well, an internet person. Go to Vanderbilt's TV all right. uh, uh, archives. Okay. You're here at CUNY TV. You're going to sit in this chair. Not necessarily with this set. I won't sit in that chair. That's your chair. Oh, hey, they're going to bronze it. You got 28 and a half minutes a week. Every week, what are you gonna do? Well, uh, besides show up, <laughs> I have this great <clears throat> excuse me. I have this fantasy. We take the show on the road, and where I want to take the show first is Flor it. is wait, oh, it's Florence. Florence. Oh, oh, Florence. You know why? Oh. Because it's an expose that nobody has done. Yeah, right. Forget it. it you want to hear it? This is going to be... Okay, this go is ahead. Start, this, is, ahead. this is going to... The world. The, the world. Medium. We're going to oh, show yeah. up in Florence. This show is going to show up in Florence late in the afternoon when the Academia closes, where the David is. Right. And we're going to focus on the back door, and we're going to watch as that guy who poses all day long as David steps off the podium oh, God. and walks out and dusts him, the marble dust off and walks out yeah. the door and hands Okay, off. Yeah, that's a Saturday Night Live skit. Forget it. You're not doing Have that Have you one. ever seen the David? Yes. Yes, I'm going. I'm, I'm leaving for Florence. In, if you've in seen week. the David, you know it is impossible to do that with a block of marble. Oh, right. It's a trick. It can't be... It can't be done. Okay, okay, let's that, talk. So there's a guy. Right. Like, and we're going like to find. The, like the people who were dressed as the Statue of Liberty, right? Right. <laughs> right. Forget we it. We are going to no, find. I, excuse we me. We are going to expose this story. Forget it. Okay. Are you going to be serious at all? Yes, I This is a job interview. Who's your first guest? You know who I'd like my first guest to be? Somebody, I, I mean, I'd like to talk interesting I'd like to talk about interesting things with interesting people who, you know, who may not have any status at all, sure. and have, but who have an interesting story to tell. And one of them is a guy named, I think, is a guy named Bob Smith. Bob Smith is maybe the preeminent Shakespeare scholar in this country. And he teaches... Uh, he's been teaching adult courses at, at, at 92nd Street Y for, I don't know, 30 years, but he's done a, many other things. Um, he has been, he's worked as a dresser. He, he has been a director. He's a person that actors, Shakespearean actors, consult about how should I interpret Lear? How should I interpret uh, Juliet? How, what do you think if I play it this way? But, but the inter I don't want to, the reason I would like the world to know more about Bob Smith is his personal story of how he comes to Shakespeare as a ten year old boy. You're not going to shoot the interview here. No, but I'm going to tell you oh, this okay. is the teaser. Oh, as okay. a ten year old boy, he discovers Shakespeare, and it literally saves his life. Wow. Wow. So, so I would like him to come on. Okay, so you're talking about public affairs in a very broad notion. I bet you you're sick of politicians oh, and I'm, politics. If I never but you got to do you got every once in a while. Can I tell you my Ed Koch story? You've got a minute and 30 seconds and that's it and that's then it? they cut you off, the oh, lights no, go terrible. off. Okay, I'm going to try to do this fast. I covered Ed Koch forever. It, 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 he, I thought he was a, a good mayor, but boy, it was it was it wearing to to uh, to be around him because it was so narcissistic. So, you know, how am I doing? How am I doing? And the news directors loved it, the boss, because his comment. They wanted them on the news every night. Right. Go get a comment from Koch about that. So one day he announces the city needs a he needs a new car. The mayoral car is, and he was right. We need a new car. But he doesn't just say, we're going to get a new car. He makes a production out of it. 
I'm a tall man and I need a lot of leg room in the back and you gotta understand the car is falling apart and the breakthrough, but I, the main thing is I need a lot of leg room. And he turns this simple thing into what? Into the greatest quest since Jason and the, and, and the Golden Fleece. So this goes on, he plays this soap opera for weeks. I see he's giving a speech at the Hilton, I stand outside, I wait for him, he comes out. Hi Tony, what are you doing? What, uh, what can I do for you? I said, Mr. Mayor, I got to ask you an uh, update about the car. And, ah, that car that breaks a shot, and this is going to break. But you got to remember, I need leg room. I'm a tall man. I, and I interrupted him. I said, Mr. Mayor, did you ever think about hiring a shorter driver? And he stops. And he's, you know, because he's in the back seat, shorter right. driver. And he goes, Mom. I, for once in my life, I stopped it. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> Tony, that unlike that was very good. He waves a finger at me. That was very good. Unlike you, but very, very good. That story played to raves on the air that night. You went beyond yourself. You I, excelled. As well, you're going to do in the show. I, 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 once in my life, I got the last word on Ed Koch. Okay. That was hard to do. Okay. My thanks to Tony Guida for being on the Thank show. Thank you, Doug. Watch our website for information about our shows for the new season and join Tony Guida in September as host of City Talk here on CUNY TV. Thank Tony. you, sir. That was a fast half hour. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. 